As I have come to know and experience Kevin, it is clear that God has done an incredible work in Kevin's life to make him a man uh, with a message of grace and restoration. So I'm going to invite Kevin up here, but as he's coming, uh, we're going to turn our attention to the screen and watch a short clip uh, as we get to know Kevin a little better. reports that I've got of the structure being seen on that mountain, no place else. If it's there, then people in the world ought to know about it. Do I believe there's something there? Yes. What it is, don't know. If you do see this boat sticking out of the ancient ice, it could change everything. We saw some interesting anomalies. An anomaly is something that's not normal to the ice formation. It has to be a cause bigger and greater than yourself to motivate you to do that. We're going to climb that mountain. This would be the biggest discovery in the history of the world. That mountain is a lurking beast that will just consume you if you make one small mistake. Why is it that men will sail the seven seas, climb the highest mountains, look into the vast expanse of the universe and, and try to unravel those mysteries, and yet, in the end, they're strangers to their own heart? For me, this journey has not really been about the art. It's been about really finding something more important in life and more, more lasting. What I've tried to do in the last year is actually take more of an inward journey and ask myself, what is it that we're really searching for? There's men that have come up here, their marriages are broken, they have broken relationships, broken families. They're good men, in many cases godly men, but life in some cases has been, has been hard. I really bonded with these men, and they have hearts of gold. I've traveled the world, been to 60 countries, six continents. I've climbed five of the seven summits. I've skied to the North Pole. I've journeyed to the ends of the earth. But I did not have the courage until the past year to make an 18-inch journey from your head to your heart. So we hope for good weather. I feel like I'm a better person, better father, better man because of the Ark expedition. We're looking for some type of redemption, some type of transcendent moment where we step out of the grind of life and we find something mystical, magical, something spiritual that just elevates our souls. I sought the Ark, but instead I found the face of God. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, was the food good? It was awesome. Let's give it up for the ladies that served. 
all the people that were behind the scenes. Uh, thank you, Ben and Doug, for the invitation. Wonderful brothers, love who you are, love what you do. This is incredible. Just a legion of men here uh, and our two overflows as well. So welcome, welcome. So uh, I have a lot of deer stories I can tell, but that's not why you're here. My dad and I actually used to process deer back when he was a little younger, and uh, we'd sometimes do five or 700 of those critters. So I've got every deer story in my encyclopedia that I can tell, <laughs> and it could go on and on all night long, but what you've come here to hear is uh, the story of the Ark, and so I'll stay true to, to that. So, you know, you kind of get into a story sometimes, and you're just trying to figure out how in the world did I land here. Sometimes when I watch... The Lord of the Rings, or I read some of Tolkien's work, and you've got these hobbits that are just kind of wandering into the, the you know, the, the vagaries of Mordor, and they were in this quiet place of the Shire, and then they're talking to each other, and they're wondering, how in the world did I end up in this tale? How did I end up in this story? And in many ways, the story of the Ark and the involvement or the search that we had for the Ark over those course of five summers, they actually filmed at the final year, had that kind of feeling to it. And it was this question I kept asking myself over and over again, how in the world did I end up in this story? And it would take too long to totally unpack that, but I want you to think about this as we begin to get into this story tonight and then all the different tributaries that kind of weave into that is Proverbs chapter 25, verse two states that the glory of God is the secret and the glory of man, or kings, if you will, and I see a lot of kings here tonight, is the search. And so I want you to allow that to just kind of marinate in your soul tonight, this idea that God will put a secret in front of you, some great mystery, some thorn in your flesh, glass in your brain, whatever metaphor you want to apply, and it's this thing that drives you. It's this subterranean movement that happens so deep in your soul, it develops a sub-narrative to the obvious narrative, and you're not even aware of what's happening because you haven't taken time to stop, pull up the hood, and see what's happening in the engine. And so I want you to just kind of think about that. What is the real story that's going on here? Because I speak all over the place. This is a real blessing for me tonight. I feel like I've already talked for three hours because I got here a little early and there's a ton of guys here I know. I usually blow in and blow out, blow in, blow up and blow out because I speak all over the nation. This is a real treasure to do life with you guys and to invite you to base camp because we can't do that everywhere we go. But um, I often find when I'm in conversation with a man, usually what's the first question you ask? Or as you weave into it, you know, what do you do? Because that easily defines a man. It's what he does with his hands. It's, it's how he makes his living. It's how he provides for his family. And that's this obvious, explicit narrative. But this oblique, implicit narrative, which is subterranean, is, is a deeper question. And it's basically this. I know what you do, but who are you? What's the name that God has given you? What is the calling that's on your life? This thing that uh, you, it's always on. You never really turn it off. It's this theme that weaves its way like a golden thread throughout your life. But you feel like all these dots, all these pixels are just floating around in this nebula and you never have enough time or space or quietness in your own soul to be able to collect those random dots and start connecting them and making a picture that becomes crystal clear so that you can wake up in the morning and hit your feet on the ground and know what your purpose is and you know who you are. You wanna talk about a dangerous man? Talk about a man who knows who he is. When the people persecuted Christ, they didn't necessarily go after what he did. They got angry because of who he said he was. And I want you to just kind of allow that to help just kind of ruminate inside of you this evening because I was a guy who went on this expedition and really didn't have a clue as to who I was. Had a ton of wounds. I felt like the guy that Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Soviet dissident, he argued against the Stalin regime and so they stuck him in the Siberian gulag for a decade and that's basically a man grinding machine. You're not supposed to live. <laughs> you're supposed to work until you die and then they, you're, that's your only exit point. And uh, he made it through that, was one of the few that was able to survive that and wrote a whole bunch of stuff. And one of the things that he said really resonates with me and he, it, it kind of gets lost in translation because the vernacular that he used is not very accessible, but he said something along these lines and it stuck with me the first time I read it. He said, a man's life is a series of encryptions or mysteries, algorithms, enigmas, 
Uh, and his life is a series of those elements, and if he can't interpret those rightly, he despairs. I was a very desperate, despairing man all five summers that I was on Mount Ararat. And I couldn't put my finger on it because I felt like what we were supposed to do was find the ark, and I'll allow you to buy the DVD to find out if we found the ark of biblical history. What I can tell you is that I found the ark of my story, which probably in the end was more important. A lot of the special ops guys came up to me, especially in 2013. We were in a nefarious uh, atmosphere there on Mount Ararat. Uh, there's a lot of different elements there. People are, why don't you just go up the mountain and find it? Every year, about every six months, I have a guy just tracks me down because he saw me in the film and he's like, I found the ark. And I was like, really? How'd you find it? Oh, Google Earth. I was like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> why did we spend five years looking for this thing with ground penetrating radar? We had remote sensory intel telling us one thing, there's something underneath the ice. We don't know what it is. You're not gonna find out what it is unless you drill, unless you excavate. So we're dragging ground penetrating radar, which works really well on dirt. It doesn't work so well on ice because it looks like you're looking through a broken windshield. And then we're drilling and then we're digging down these Herculean holes that are like eight by eight down to 40 feet with this $6,000 floorless tent. And we're risking life and limb and there's electric activity in the air to the extent that you feel like your head is being thrown into a beehive's nest. On top of that, you have a mountain that is the main character in the movie itself. This thing is a living beast. It's breathing. Uh, the, the, the vents are opening up. You get to the top of the mountain and it feels like, wow, this, this is like a dragon. You can smell sulfur in the air. It's hurling rocks at you like the movie The Hobbit. You've got crevasses that are opening up in the daytime, closing and constricting at night that can swallow you whole. I was basically the guy that found where the crevasses were because I fell into them. And I was the guy that's pretty tall, so I always do the spread eagle, pop out. There's ways that you can do this, and I was very fortunate that they weren't larger than what they were. But I was like, why, why did I think of that? I could have just gone to Google Earth. And they're just trying to find the ark, and they're just obsessed with this thing because they think if you just find this thing, and it's a huge deal. I mean, I risked five summers of my life looking for this thing. If you find the ark, it changes all the ologies. Everything from anthropology to zoology. You gotta write, write a ton of academic books. You're gonna, you're gonna infuriate the Smithsonian. You're gonna infuriate National Geographic. These people don't like this thing to be found, which adds to some of the cloak and dagger element to it. But I'm on this mountain, I'm thinking, I've gotta find this ark, I gotta find this ark. And I had ark fever. Some of you have buck fever. I've never had that. I think part of it is because I've processed thousands of deer in my lifetime with my dad. But it's this feverish pitch and I looked around and I was like, man, these guys are all like me. They have something broken in their story. And it seems like they're running. And it seems like the thing that they're looking for is something they actually left behind. Why is it that all these special ops guys are here with us? And all these guys that have broken relationships and fractured marriages and, and a childhood trauma, what are we really looking for here? Which I intimated in the video. What's really going on here? What's happening underneath the hood? What's the sub-narrative that's driving this story? In 2013, a couple of the special ops guys pulled me aside. Uh, this is a very geopolitically unstable part of the world. For those of you that are familiar with that region, we're about 10 clicks from Iran. Um, they have their own feelings about us. We have our own feelings about them. When you actually meet the people, they're quite nice, actually. In fact, most of them would hug me on the mountain because it's probably the first time they ever saw an actual American. And uh, the PKK is there, which is your local friendly homegrown terrorist group. And they are militarized Kurds that uh, are seeking to get their land back that they lost after World War I when that region was remapped and all of a sudden Kurdistan went away. So they're angry. They want their land back as Americans. That would probably put us up in arms as well. Uh, they're going about it through, through violent uh, extremism, and they're fighting and killing Turks. So on this mountain, you've got, uh, if you want to get on the mountain, all the uh, mules that you're using, all the operational logistics all go through essentially two main clans. And they don't like each other, so it's like a Hatfield-McCoy thing. And so you've got all those political tensions going around, those tribal connections. And you're trying to get through the mountain and getting your gear up to 17 and a half thousand feet, which is 60% less oxygen than what we have at sea level. So you're trying to do all this work. You've got guys running chainsaws, cutting ice blocks, fainting at the same time. How many of you know this is not OSHA approved? <laughs> this is a bad deal for those of you that are really into safety. This is not a safe place. And then you've got all these political tensions. So there was a couple of instances where I had to sleep half the night in a ditch somewhere because the two sides were fighting and they didn't want us to be collateral damage because Americans getting killed is big news, all for the wrong reasons. It's bad for business. And uh, so we always had guys with us who uh, had a very special skill set. 
and they would help people exit off the planet. They would do what you do to deer. And so uh, that's what their job was. And they were with us in 2013 as they were every year before. And two of the guys in particular uh, pulled me aside and I couldn't get either one of them past 14 and a half thousand feet. And I figured out why when one guy pulled up his pant leg, about half of his calf muscle was gone. I was like, well, that, yeah, that probably is not gonna help you. And another guy pulled his shirt up and he had to Frankenstein all the flesh back on his bone because a piece of shrapnel had just flayed it off and they flung it back on and he's on pain meds. And so his days are up and down because he's dealing with altitude plus um, extreme pain, nerve damage. And uh, they said something to me that I'll never forget. They said, uh, Kev, we know you haven't done the combat thing, although this is a demilitarized zone, and, um, but you're kind of, you got what we got. And I got quiet and I was like, well, what's that, arc fever? And they're like, no, um, you've got post-traumatic stress syndrome or disorder, whichever word you'd prefer. And I was like, really? I, I thought that was just like for, you know, combat guys. And, and I was like, well, how do you, why would you say that? And they said, well, when we look in your eyes, you get that same 2,000 yard stare that we had. Lights are on, nobody's home. And then when you talk, I want you to listen carefully here because this will identify some of the reasons why you may feel spiritually stuck. When you talk, you're always talking about the future, your next mountain, your next expedition, or you're beating yourself up over your past, you're punishing your past, you're fearing your future, but you're never now. So that planted a seed and um, I began thinking about, well, what's going on here? So let me rewind the tape here. This was in 2013. These guys are causing me to think. And um, I'll take you back to February 22nd, 1998. And uh, I'm preaching at a church in Detroit area. And kind of feels much like this actually. Back door over there, nobody's behind me on the stage. I'm preaching a sermon that morning on all scripture texts. It was Genesis chapter six, which is about the flood. And it talks specifically in verse eight uh, that God's heart was filled with pain. And when you render that scripture verse, it gives this idea that God's heart was, with, was in so much pain that he could no longer speak. And some of you know what that feels like. It's that time when you pick up the phone and you find out that your kid's not coming home. It's time when you uh, wake up one morning and your wife just says, I, I don't wanna be married to you anymore. You went to bed with your wife and you woke up the next morning and you're like, man, somebody stole her heart out the door because I'm in the room with a stranger. It's a time when you go to work and uh, you put in your decades of work and you've climbed the ladder and they're like, you know, we need to downsize and thank you for your service and please pick up your stuff and go. It's time you go to the doctor. You think it's just a normal checkup. And he's like, well, you got about six months. The inhale, the vertigo, the sense of spatial disorientation. And I think God in that moment was in so much pain that poetically he must have just wept, ripped open the canopy of the universe and flooded the earth. And I think his heart just burst open from the deeps and flooded the earth from the bowels of the earth. And as I'm poetically rendering that portion of scripture, a gentleman comes in through the back of the church, young man, uh, it's kind of packed out and there's uh, one chair left next to a young lady very attractive. Um, the way he makes a beeline to that seat, it becomes obvious that he, she saved the seat for him. And uh, while I'm preaching this message, I had heard some stuff leading up to that day that was um, shocking, foreboding, uh, a harbinger of hellish events that were soon to unfold. And the three guys came in the, in the span of a week and uh, broke some news to me that I didn't want to hear. First two guys, I, I actually told them that they had offended me and asked them to leave. The third guy came in and I was at that point listening a little bit better. And so this feeling of unrest, uh, this disturbance, if you will, inside of me is, is becoming, it's coming to the surface. 
And I watched this young man come to the back row of the church, sit down next to this young lady and uh, puts his arm around her chair and she kind of comes in close. And uh, he does the same and they're both smiling at me and you would think, man, they must be like dating or they're engaged or they're married. Well, the last part of that story is true. Um, She's married, that's my wife, and that guy is my intern. And the three guys that came up to me uh, leading up to this event had all said basically the same thing. You are addicted to the ministry. You don't have a clue as to what's going on in your marriage. Your wife is lonely. Your marriage is vulnerable. And this guy and your, your wife are connecting. How many of you know that's not a typical Sunday morning? Okay, this is, this is the stuff of nightmares because it has this surreal quality to it where you, uh, you're the only person that's really seeing this. And so it feels surreal. And it's like, man, am I going to wake up from this thing? This is just like horrible. And it kind of felt like in that moment, like uh, the dragon had showed up. And uh, he burned down the gates, the gates of the church. And he came in and he just violated the place. And something that should have been safe, something that should have been sacred was, was destroyed. And I watched in a nanosecond as my marriage and my ministry and my message and arguably my masculinity were maligned and, and, and actually obliterated before my eyes to the extent where I don't even know how I finished the sermon. It felt like somebody had just shoved a hand grenade down my throat, pulled a pin, and then wired my jaw shut, and everything imploded on the inside. And all the soul shrapnel just, it infected me. And I began to live out of lies because I believe that if, if, if that had to happen, it must be that I'm a terrible human being, complete failure as a husband, absolutely unlovable, and will never be able to love again. Finished the message, went backstage, uh, left, my left, your right. I still remember grabbing the handrails, just feeling like, wow, tremendous sense of vertigo. Uh, just like, did that really happen? I can't even believe what, and I just remember speaking this oath out of my mouth to the pastor. I just says, I will never preach again, ever. Where am I? Be careful what you say. (laughs) Be careful what comes out of your mouth because both sides hear it. The enemy doesn't know what you're thinking necessarily. He hears what you're saying. And at that moment, he was probably saying, checkmate. We got this guy. He'll never get back in the pulpit again because the last time he did that, that happened. So every time I get up and speak, they always ask me, you ask me, do you want the pulpit here? And I was like, no, 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 just keep it away from me. I couldn't figure out the first six months I was speaking. I started doing this again in 2016. I went through like a 15 year exile, made a ton of money, traveled the world, climbed a whole bunch of mountains. I'd always take the pulpit and put it behind me. And I couldn't figure, why am I doing that? It's so weird. It's because I can't be behind that thing. There's just something about that thing. And there's something about that empty chair in the back row of the church that I kept making an eyeball towards. Now, let me just say this very briefly here, because the first time I shared the story, I didn't realize that there was a guy in the room that was four or five years ago. There was just six or seven or eight of us and I'm basically weeping out the story. There's so much shame there. I couldn't even tell my parents for five years, even after the marriage ended in divorce, they ended up getting married. I couldn't get it out of my mouth. They just like, well, you went through a divorce. What happened? I, I, I really just can't tell you. And I just spewed this story out and I didn't realize that there was a guy in that room who had basically taken his best friend's wife away from him. 30 years of guilt and shame and regret and self-hatred. And he just, this, my story touched his story. And so I began to realize, you know what? We're all adulterers. Every man in this room is an adulterer. What are you talking about? I've been faithful in life. Sure, you probably have. A lot of you have. Maybe most of you have. But if you've ever looked at a woman lustfully that is not your wife, Jesus Christ said, in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So when I tell this story, I know it sometimes divides like the Red Sea. You got the guys on this side of the camp, like, oh, wow, yeah, he's in my camp. I totally get that. And then you get the guys in the camp, they're like, oh, man, I did that. Guys, the ground is level at the cross. I just happen to be standing up here, but I'm actually down in the pew with you. I identify more with you now than I ever have before because I can feel the pain. I'll take you through the rest of the story here. So I walk out of that church and I'm like, man, I just, I don't want anything to do with ministry again. I'm like out of here. So I started a business that actually had already been started. And then that went crazy, made a ton of money, traveled the world, climbed five of the seven continental summits, skied to the North Pole, 
did a bunch of other crazy stuff. A lot of the guys and gals that I climbed with are no longer here uh, because they were like me. I didn't, wasn't really, I've never really been afraid of death. Death has never really had a, yeah, you know, it's, it's not a bad way to go. You're doing what you love. But living? Holy cow, did that scare? That scared me to death. And uh, so I'm on the mountain and these guys are saying this thing to me. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm back to February 22nd, 1998. And I'm like, you know what? I think something happened that day that I have not acknowledged. I think I swallowed some lies. I think my soul got infected. And then here's the crazy diabolical thing about wounds. The devil really doesn't want to kill you. He wants to wound you because then you'll take out a whole bunch of other people. Because if you're on the battlefield and you get wounded, four or five other guys have got to rescue you, you got to extract you, and then there's a whole other bunch of people in the, further down the process that have to get all the shrapnel out, put your limbs back together, do whatever. He just wants to wound you because he knows if you're wounded, you're going to be like a wild animal. And you're going to run, and you're going to run, and you're going to run. And anybody that gets in your inner circle, you're going to be like a, a wounded animal. You're going to bark. The teeth are going to come out. Nobody's going to get close to you. are going to be like a drowning swimmer. The minute people start getting into your story and start touching your owie, if you will, you're going to drown them. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a horrible thing to see somebody drowning and take somebody down with him. It's a horrible, horrible thing to witness. And some of you, that is the state of your soul tonight. People have been trying to get into your story. They've been trying to get into your soul. They've been trying to get into the inside of you and the teeth come out. And there's various ways that we do that. I was an expert conversational manipulator. I was a control freak, <laughs> probably borderline narcissistic as well. All these things that we do, all these defense mechanisms that we create, all these minds that we lay around ourselves, these castles that we built with these moats so that nobody gets inside because it hurts too much to get them inside. I don't want to go back to February 22nd. That's like jumping into the mouth of the dragon. Exactly. Take that same hand grenade that you've swallowed and shove it down his throat. There's one way out, guys. There's one way to see the light. Quit chasing the sun. Turn around, stand still, and let Jesus Christ bring up the dawn. You have no power to create your own resurrection. You can do the Shawshank thing. You can go through the crapshoot, if you will. You can try and escape. But what if you could just be like Peter for a moment or Jonah in the belly of the whale and just allow the angels to come and to put time asleep and break chains that you don't have the power to break so that when you're set free, you can't take credit for it. Your ego is destroyed. You didn't have anything to do with your rescue. Jonah didn't do anything to get that whale to spit him out other than just pray, God, help. Peter didn't do anything other than just sit there and wait for that angel to come and tap time on the shoulder and watch as the gates just broke open and he passed through. And what did he say in the book of Acts? It was as if he was in a dream. You know what God's doing tonight? He's putting time to sleep. Eternity is waking up. He's creating a thin place. And in that thin place, anything can happen. Dead men might even come back to life. So I'm full of this shrapnel. I'm full of these wounds. I drag all this stuff into a second marriage. This woman is a great woman. We have two children together. And I never let her get close to me. I say that with great regret. Because as that relationship went further into nine years, it became painfully evident that if you are divorced from yourself, which I was, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to live on a deep level with another human being, let alone be married to them, which is essentially what marriage is. It's giving and taking. It's doing deep life with another person. I was not emotionally available to either one of my wives. I was an orphan, in a sense. I was a leper, in a sense, which is what shame does. It numbs you so you don't have any feeling left. You're walking around and parts of your body are falling off. Parts of your soul are falling off. You're becoming a shell. You're becoming like a wraith. This wound, almost like Frodo on Weathertop with the witch king of Morgul, just sticking that blade into him. He didn't kill him, but he got that blade. He had that shrapnel, that shard. And as each sentence went on, each paragraph developed, this Frodo character, this hobbit, becomes more and more like the person who struck him with the blade. He becomes a wraith, a shadow, a mist of what he once was. 
And here I am in 2013, I feel like, I remember writing in 2010 in my journal, I looked it up the other day and I wrote these words, I feel more like an animal than a human being. I feel like I am running. I went to the end of, I went to the farthest north that you could go. I went all the way to the North Pole. I went to the ends of the earth. And still this blood trail followed me. I crossed every stream. I climbed every mountain, but I couldn't get away from my past because it always came with me. Sooner or later, I figured out everywhere I go, he already is. God's at your lowest point. He's at your highest point. He's all over the place. So I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. The blood trail is following me. I can hear the hounds of heaven and hell both howling at the same time. I feel like a fugitive. I feel like a leper. I don't feel anything actually. God, what I would do just to feel, (laughs) just to feel something anything. Instead of this cold, calculated indifference, this numbness that is so pervasive. The second marriage goes nine years and it ends in divorce. Concurrently, I walk through a bankruptcy. All the money's gone. Lose the house. Lose arguably my sanity get on the mountain in 2013, get off the mountain that summer. And because I can't face an empty room and the lack of children's laughter and the lack of the warmth of home, I end up living in my vehicle for the next half decade. There's two guys right at this table, Kurt French and Jeff Belmonte that teamed up and ganged up on me a couple months ago and said, enough. We know you speak everywhere and you like to speak because I give you a hotel room. It's great. I got my own bathroom. It's unbelievable. Some of you are checking out, how in the world did that guy do that? It's called health clubs, all right? I'll just leave it at that. I showered every day. No one even guessed it. I could hang out with the multimillionaires because I was one of them. I had the Nick Mansion. I had the money. I had all the stuff. I can do that talk. I had locker rooms next to guys that had all the stuff and I could talk that stuff. And then I realized I have a locker here because they do my laundry and because I can actually have a place where I can just kind of relax because I'm, I'm scared out of my mind of going into an empty room because it just shouts at me, you've lost it all. That's what hopelessness feels like. It'll never end. And you go into this dark room and there's no key that will unlock this thing. And it's locked from the inside and out and your fear has made you a captive. And now you've got these special ops guys saying, you're just like one of us. And now I know what it feels like to have to come home after war and to have all these people around you and not be able to connect because you've been kicked out of your own movie. Somebody else is playing your life. You can't even jump into your own narrative because you're so numb. You're so shell-shocked. You're so full of trauma and soul shrapnel. You don't even know how to love anymore. Nobody gets in. Nobody gets out because it hurts too much. And so the comfort zone ends up being Mount Ararat. The comfort zone ends up being Iraq. The comfort zone ends up being Afghanistan because the real front is at home where people want to get into your life One minute you're killing people and operating multi-million dollar pieces of weaponry. And the next minute you're, you're, you're just doing stuff, menial stuff. And that's how I felt every year coming back off the mountain. I was like, man, how do I just re-engage life? How do I, how do I find home? Went into some therapy and all these guys are saying the same thing. Dude, you don't have a home address. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I get that. I got a PO box, but here's my, driver's license. See the mistake that I made, guys? Living in the Nick Mansion, there's nothing wrong with it. God blessed me at that chapter of my life, and God has blessed those of you, but can I ask you something here? Don't make the mistake thinking that your house is your home, because you will not live in that house forever, but you will live inside here forever with him. This is the part, the heart where eternity resides in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is the thing that goes on and on and on. And I think God had to take me into a very drastic situation where he had to show me that, Kevin, it's not about a place. It's about a sacred space 
Why do you think my son didn't have a home the last three years of his life? Why do you think he never had a place to rest his head because the son of man had no place to rest his head because he was always at home in his heart right here, right now. I am so present right now, I can feel it. I'm in a moment right now because I've done the 18 inch journey. People have asked me, what have you done the last couple years? Well, since the mountain, about 18 inches. Uh, whew. okay, next. <laughs> what are you talking about? Is this guy some kind of metaphysic existential weirdo? No, I'm talking about getting out of your brain, getting into your heart. This is where the ego lives. This is where all your problems exist. You get into the heart, that's where eternity lives. It's where all the possibilities exist. But you can't get from here to here unless this starts healing because the last place you want to go into is a place where there's pain. So how did I find healing? July the 7th, 2013, God gave me a gift. Prostate memory relapse, you can call it whatever you want, a flashback. Uh, some of you can relate to this. You hear something, you smell something, it's a name. It's something that triggers something. It's not voluntary. It happens in an involuntary uh, reflex. I was cleaning the stuff up out of my parents' home, actually out of the condo and moving it to my parents' home, which is humiliating. Here I am in my mid-40s and I'm back to being 21 all over again. I don't owe anybody anything, but I don't own anything. And I just felt like God just said, okay, I want you to open this box within a box and uh, inside that box, I want you to listen to something. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. How many of you have boxes you've never opened up for like decades? You just drag them around every house you know, it's just like, what is this stuff? You know, you have storage units to store your junk and you never look at it. It's just, oh, I got to keep that junk, you know? <laughs> so I had a box in a box and um, in this last box is a box of cassette tapes. Now for Generation Z and millennials out there, a cassette tape is a magic piece of technology. <laughs> to be honest with you, I didn't really care about the arc. I was just trying to find Noah's cassette tape and his cassette tape player that he kept the animals all docile and really, you know, just kind of there, just nursery rhyme music. So it's this ancient piece of technology. When I try to describe it to my son, he's like, Dad, did you find that on the ark? Was that on the ark? Is that what you were looking for? So it's this ancient piece of technology, not quite as ancient as an eight track tape for those of you Clearwater Revival people out there. It's this thing you put in, it's got this metallic thing and this magical sounds comes out of it and it does all these different things. And so I plugged it into my 1999 Toyota. This is July of 2013. And um, I'm playing it. And I look at the tape, and what does it say? February 22nd, 1998. Man, I know this voice. Wow, I wish I could go back to that guy. I wish I could just put my arm around his shoulder. I wish I could tell him it's going to be all right. I wish I could tell him, you need to get into a community of men. You got to get your story out. Wish I could tell them that you better pay attention to your wounds because not only will that drive you to madness, but that's also where the great mystery is. In fact, that's where your calling is. Guys, I want you to jump into your pain tonight, not because I'm some kind of guy that just wants to just make you, you know, embrace the suck like the Navy SEALs do. I'm asking you to go inside your pain because I want you to catch this. If you're a note taker, if you want to have something cemented on your heart and tattooed in your, in your memory, your purpose is encrypted inside your pain. It's so clever, we miss it. It's so simple, we also miss it. It's exactly why the enemy doesn't want you to go into your pain, because when you get into your pain, you find your genius, you find your calling, you find God's glory resident. Why do you think the cross had to happen? Why do you think the manger had to happen? Because it's the place that people least expected in a barn on a cursed tree, but that's where God does his mystery. So I'm listening to this tape and uh, man, it feels like I'm on the deck of the Enterprise or the Millennial Falcon. Everything's coming at me in warp speed. I feel like I'm in Michigan in a snowstorm in the winter, the high beams are on and this rage comes out. I pull over on the side of the road and I'm just really broken at this point and I'm having a conversation. It's a Job moment. It's an audience of one and this rage comes out. How 
dare you wound me twice in the same place? Of all the things that you allowed to happen or allowed me to make mistakes over or whatever, whatever, I can't figure out the whys and the what's of all of it. How dare you take the same blade and wound me in the same place twice? How dare you allow me to, to, to tithe my way into bankruptcy? Don't you know that that offends my mind? It offends my sense of right and wrong. It, affect, it affects and impacts my sense of entitlement. You're supposed to bless that. And I calm down for a moment. And I hear these words. I had to wound you twice in the same place to heal you once and for all. And then it gets incredibly quiet. I don't know if you guys have ever had a moment like this, but I call in an audience of one. And uh, it's a Job moment. And there's no more counselors. There's no community. There's no church. There's nothing. You're standing naked before Almighty God. And you've given him all your best arguments. And you've thrown all of your your unanswerable questions to him. And instead of exploding your mind because you can't comprehend the answer, instead of answering those unanswerable questions, he gives you himself as the answer, his unquestionable self. And it got so quiet, I can almost hear the morning star singing that the book of Job talks about. We're at the dawn of creation, the morning stars, they were singing. And the silence was so deep, I could hear the song of creation and I could hear just the groans of the universe and all these complexities that I can't even get my mind wrapped around. And I'm hearing God say this to me, you misunderstand me. And I said, God, what are you talking about? And he said, you've got your metaphors all mixed up. And I said, can you help me here? Because I'm not getting any of those. And he said, you think because of your shame, you created a separate God in your world. And you created this God out of shame. And you hid from that God because you were ashamed of your past. And I kept hanging out in the garden and I was always there for you and I was always waiting. But you made this separate God that's not me and you hid from that God and I've always been here and I've never left. And you mistook me for a warden at a prison and you thought all this pain that you felt was punitive. And you know what I'm doing in your life right now? I'm a surgeon. And I'm trying to put you back on the same operating table that you ran from in, in 1998 because it hurt too much. And I have to tell you this, you can't feel unless you heal. You can't heal unless you feel. And if you don't feel this thing, you're never gonna heal from this thing. So I've gotta rip you open on this operating table and I'm gonna get right down to the root of this thing. And it may feel like you're dying. And in fact, that's actually what's happening. I'm trying to kill you. And I'm like, well, where's that in the Bible? Holy cow, do I even know who this God is? And then it gets quiet again as some of these dialogue pieces are happening and it didn't happen all instantaneous. Some of this gets protracted over a period of time. But now I'm beginning to understand that he's wounding me to heal me. And who am I to tell the surgeon? Imagine this, you're on the operating table and you pull the surgeon to the aside and say, hey, you know, um, I got a plan for us. I think you need to take care of me without doing anything cutting or, you know, anything that hurts. I don't want anything, you know, just make me better. Just, I don't know, do that televangelist thing and put your hand on the TV or something, something that doesn't actually hurt. And I think we're, it's just the audacity, the ego, the, the pride, the hubris that we have, the total ignorance that we have to tell our surgeon how to make us well. And so I'm in this operating table and all these things are happening all at once. And then I hear another sound, another wave coming on me. And I hear the sound. It sounds like the, the sound of, of, of shells being crushed in the surf. It sounds like a tree full of birds singing. It sounds like the laughter of children. It sounds like the rain on top of a tin roof. And I begin to understand that God is smashing my idols. 
that I'm too weak to even begin to touch. And he's smashing the sex God and he's smashing the wealthy God and he's smashing the power God and he's smashing the ministry God and the work God. And then last of all, he's shattering the idol that I had of the perfect life that I thought I was somehow entitled to. (laughs) And he's like, this one's gonna hurt because you think You've got this thing in your life and if it doesn't match, you feel like I've betrayed you, but I want you to understand something. I am doing something so deep here. You can't even get your mind wrapped around this. You feel like Lazarus right now. And I said, yeah, I do. I feel like you showed up late. You know what, God? I feel like you betrayed me because it seems to be working for anybody, everybody else except this guy. And as I'm hearing these idols smash with holy hands, they're translucent, they're full of fire, they're not from this realm. I'm too weak to destroy these idols. I hear God just say, there's too much stuff between us and I don't want there to be any other idols before me. You'll never know I'm all you need until I'm all you have. And I'm just smashed because I ain't got nothing. I got two kids that I adore, that adore me back. In fact, he promised me two things. He says, I'm gonna put your life to this celestial combine and you're gonna lose it all. You're gonna lose all the money. Don't worry about it, probably come back. You're gonna lose the house. You lose your sanity for a part. And that's actually on purpose because sometimes you have to lose your mind to find your heart. So don't worry about that. But two things I'm not gonna allow to be touched, your health and the love and affection that you have for your children than they have for you. Guys, I am the wealthiest man in the world. I don't own anything, but I have got hundreds of guys that I'm doing life with on a deep, profound way that I would give my life for and they would do the same. I've got two kids that I love. I've got an immediate family members. I've got health. I am so incredibly rich, but I was so blind to see that all those years. I was climbing, climbing, I was pursuing, I was running. I thought, man, if I just get to the edge of the world, somehow these, this blood trail will stop. And what I didn't realize is it's all about those 18 inches. It's all about feeling so that you could heal. It's all about entering into your story. It's all about owning your story so that your story no longer owns you. And then I felt he took me into this last stage and I kind of want to close with this and just have a moment of prayer here for a moment. He said something to me and I've been resonating with this in the last several months, especially because this is another misunderstanding that I had of God. I didn't understand how his severe mercy works. I didn't understand that he was a good surgeon and that the blade might be evil, but his heart is good. And it didn't originate from him, but he was able to use those things in my life that hurt me to actually heal me. Incredibly profound, incredibly dangerous <laughs> because it could have shipwrecked my faith because the God that I had constructed, if I were God, I wouldn't do what God did to me, which is actually a really good thing because I'm not smart enough to figure out how to heal me. I'm not even smart enough to figure out how to rescue myself. I've lost all those abilities whatsoever. I'm asking God to just bring me from the dead. And here's what he said to me. He said, you know, you you do feel like Lazarus and you do feel like I betrayed you because I came late on your timetable. But I, I delayed my son on purpose. He's speaking of Jesus. He said, yeah, he could have come and he could have healed Lazarus. Sure. He did that for a bunch of people. In fact, everybody expected him to do that because these are not just people. These are VIPs. Mary and Martha, big friends of the ministry, open up their home to Christ. He loves Lazarus. He's moved when he finally arrives that Lazarus is dead, but he keeps using this weird language like, yeah, we're gonna go and we're gonna wake Lazarus up. But Lord, he's dead. He's no longer alive. You came too late. And here's what God just said to me. Yeah, I could have healed a bunch of stuff. I could have reconciled some relationships. But you were shooting way too low. You were looking at reconciliation and I had a higher form of redemption in mind for you. And it's this word called resurrection. 
I want to raise you from the dead. And the one inconvenient truth of this is you have to die first. I feel like Rumpelstiltskin right now, and I just woke up from a long dream. I went grocery shopping a couple weeks ago. I couldn't believe all the new products that have come out in the last five years. I was like, holy cow, I want to spend five hours in this place. I feel like I'm coming out of a dream. I feel like I'm coming back to life. When C.S. Lewis talked about his conversion, he didn't use all this Christianese language. He said, it felt like as if I was waking from a dream. Henry David Thoreau, I wouldn't necessarily base your theology on him, but he said something very profound. He says, the deepest life that a man can have is that of a waking dream. February 22nd, 1998 had to happen so that tonight could happen. Genesis 45 would have never happened where Joseph is in front of his brothers and he's able to say some pretty profound things. 22 years have happened since he was thrown into the well by his brothers who first wanted to kill him and then they ended up selling him into slave trafficking. And then through a series of events, miraculous, because the dream never died, but the dreamer had to, he finds himself as the second most powerful man in the world. His brothers have now come from their own homeland to Egypt, which is the center of, of hope for the known world at that point, going through massive, intense famine. And he says these words to his brothers who are filled with guilt, filled with remorse, filled with self-hatred, drowning in shame, looking at their father every day and realizing they've lied to him and they've dragged him down to the grave before his time. He says these words to them. You didn't send me to Egypt. Dramatic pause, exclamation point. God did. Guys, I don't have the intellect to understand how that all works, but what I'm saying is, is can you please be kind to yourself? Can you please love yourself, maybe an infinitesimal amount with the love that God loves you? Can you forgive those who have hurt you? Because it may very well have been that they had a part to play in your story to put you in the right place at the right time with the right people. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, um, I've given you about the only thing I have left, which is human weakness. I know you have everything. There's nothing that um, I have really that you don't already have because it's all owned by you anyway. But I know that the one thing I can give you is the one thing you don't have, but it's the thing that you need to do miracles. So God, I give you my human weakness. The same way you, you were born into this world in a vulnerable place, in a filthy place, in a barn. And you died in a filthy place on a cross because you wanted to show us your love and how you partner with our frail mortality to let the divine invade the space-time continuum as we know it. And so, Father, I pray for those who are young here tonight, the boys, and they feel like God has betrayed them. Maybe they prayed for their parents to stay together. Maybe they prayed that someone would stop doing to them what they should not be doing in the first place. God, just speak to them. Tell them that you are never more present, never more powerful than when they were going right into the middle of their pain. For the middle-aged man, for the young man, for the older man here who just feels like he's a leper and he feels like he's stuck. Jesus, we know that trauma is like some white witch that just comes into our Narnian type landscape and it freeze frames our life and it hurts the boy so the boy can never grow up to become a man and we continue to do crazy things and we continue to hurt people because we're hurt ourselves and we know that hurt people hurt people. So Father, I've prayed for the literal young boy and I pray for the metaphoric young boy that's here tonight that's still wounded. Heal those wounds, Jesus. Take the shrapnel out. Kill the lies. In fact, God, I pray that you kill the past. Kiss our present and free our future. Resurrect dead people tonight, God. Resurrect dead memories resurrect dead dreams, 
resurrect dead men. Bring them back to life, God. He could have done so many things for Lazarus before he died, but he had to die because he needed to hear the voice of his king beyond the shadows. He needed to hear the voice of Aslan. He needed to hear the roar of the Lion of Judah, and he needed to hear him say, come forth in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so I pray for that for every man that's gathered here tonight. I pray that the dead things inside their heart will come back to life. I pray that the Lion of Judah will roar into their existence, will roar into the empty quarters of their soul, will roar into the vast nebula, that interior geography that they don't want to touch, that they don't want to feel because the dragon came and the bells rang in the dale and the men's faces were pale and the, and the shards of shrapnel went into their soul and they were kicked outside of their home and they've wandered as noble exiles and they don't have a name and they don't have a future and they don't have a hope. Lion of Judah, come and breathe life. We know it's always winter. It's never spring until we hear the roar of the king. And so Lord Jesus, I am asking you as the king, because I have no words of my own that can resurrect the dead to life. I pray that you speak into the heart of men tonight. The times are dark. Men are behaving poorly. We need men who are coming back from life, from death, back into life. Kill the things that need to be killed. Kill the past. Kiss the present. Free the future in Jesus' name, I pray. God, I see kings everywhere. I see men whose crowns have fallen to the ground. I see shattered swords that need to be reforged. I see nameless exiles wandering the wounded wastelands of their own soul. And I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our captain that will follow to the gates of hell. I ask that you resurrect those men. I ask that you reforge that blade. I pray that you remove that shrapnel and give them back their name. Help us to remember who we are. We're sons, we're not slaves. We're more than soldiers. We're sons of the King. Give us back our nobility, God. Give us back our purity. Give us back our destiny. Give us back our life. Holy Spirit, just seal what you've started here tonight. This is a crazy story. This is a crazy adventure. All I have is human weakness to give. I pray that you touch that. And I pray that people can see the image of Christ. And I pray that they can hear and feel the brush of the, of, of the, of the lion God. They can feel the whiskers that puts time to sleep. And they can walk into that wardrobe and they can feel the mane of his fur tickle their cheek and feel time fall asleep and give them that moment that I had so many years ago and continue to have where time doesn't mean anything anymore, but eternity means everything. Invade the time space continuum and do the things that only you can do. Suspend time. It obeys you, God, like nature. I pray for that in the name of Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.